We're going to be looking at Mark chapter 14, verse 53 through to chapter 15, verse 15. If you haven't read through this, maybe pause now and go back and read through these passages uh, because we're just going to be dipping into them and looking at some of the impact of what's going on in these verses. Uh, I hope you've uh, been enjoying working through Mark's Gospel with us uh, here at SALT. Uh, For me, it's been an incredible privilege to go back and look closely again at these wonderful words about Jesus and words of Jesus to help us to understand what God is on about in our world. It was relevant then, it's relevant now. Uh, As we look at this passage, I want to give uh, a word of appreciation to a mate, Tim Baldwin. Uh, Tim has uh, looked into this passage and he's just given me a couple of insights uh, that I'm going to be drawing on as I look at this with you now. So let's pray that God will help us as we look at this part of his word together. Heavenly Father, please speak the truth through me. Help uh, me to understand and communicate well. Help us all to take on board what we're learning. And we pray that we'll be prepared to follow Jesus, come whatever may. Amen. Well, here's a question for you. Why don't more people follow Jesus? I mean, we look around about us and there seem to be so few people at church on a Sunday, so few people who'd own up to being Christian. Uh, The stats uh, probably lie. You look at people who say that they're into Christianity, they're a religious person, they're Anglican, Baptist, Presbyterian, Uniting, Catholic, whatever. But it probably isn't a fair indication of who's actually following Jesus. And I suspect that we're probably talking about a very small number. Some suggest probably less than 3 or 4% of Australians are following Jesus. Especially given the fact that most Australians probably know something about him. What is it that keeps us from being willing to give ourselves to Jesus? And one of the reasons I suggest to you is that following Jesus is really very threatening. And we'll see as we look at Mark uh, and this part of Mark's gospel that it was threatening then to people and it continues to be threatening today. And I want to look at each of these three accounts. First of all, with the Sanhedrin and the various religious leaders. Secondly, with Peter, the follower of Jesus. And then lastly, with Pilate, the Roman procurator. And look at how Jesus was a threat to each of these Uh, three groups in each of these incidents. So the first threat really is to the chief priests and to the elders and to the teachers of the law. And we've seen through Mark's gospel that there's been conflict after conflict after conflict with the religious leaders. In fact, some of them are so determined to get rid of Jesus that they unite together with the Herodians, that is people who were normally their enemies, to conspire to work out how to kill Jesus. And this tension has been there right through Mark's gospel from chapter 8 onwards. Jesus has started to let his disciples know that he's expecting to die. Uh, He's headed to Jerusalem where he says he will be executed. Well, what we discover when we look at this account here is that the high priest together with the chief priests, the elders and the teachers of the law come together to actually set up a court to hear evidence against Jesus. Now, the extraordinary thing about this, first of all, is that they do this in the middle of the night. This is no ordinary sitting of a court. This isn't something that, you know, might take days or months even till there's time to actually go about this hearing. It's happening right here, right now, in the middle of the night. Now, that's a little bit sus, isn't it? Uh, Jesus is here uh, before the Sanhedrin in the middle of the night, And we notice in verse 56, the chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were actually looking for evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death, but they couldn't find any. Now, that's really quite spurious, I think, because here are the prosecutors and the judges, and they're the same group of people. And you think they still can't find any evidence. Uh, This is a dodgy courtroom scene. And verse 56, many testified falsely against him, But their statements didn't agree. So they can't even conspire well. They can't even come up with a common testimony against Jesus. Some stand up and they give false testimony against him. And they say things like, He said he will destroy this temple made with human hands and in three days will build another not made with hands. Now we know that's kind of close to what Jesus was talking about, but they can't even agree on their testimony there. 
And then the high priest stands up and he asks Jesus whether he's going to answer, uh, whether he's got anything to say, and Jesus remains silent. Well, here is an incident where there is everything against Jesus. And we might pause to think, why would it be that these religious leaders, these uh, bastions of taking hold of God's promised word and, and the Old Testament as we know it now, who are responsible for shepherding, for pastoring, <clears throat> for providing leadership to the people of God, why would they want to kill Jesus? And I think the simple answer is that he's a threat. Jesus is a threat to the power, to the authority, to the autonomy, to the, uh, the significant leadership that these people have enjoyed for decades, for centuries. Here are the people who really are the religious elite and they love being so. They parade around. Uh, they like to be seen by people. They love it that people look up to them. And now here's another person on the scene. Jesus, who's commanding an audience, he's gathering followers, he's teaching in a way which has an extraordinary authority, so different to the way that they teach. And he's doing miracles, and people are starting to take this man seriously. And they see that as a threat to their position. Now, if that's what's going on back then, friends, I take it that it's no different today. We still see Jesus as a threat to our autonomy, to our independence, to our decision making. See, we don't want anybody taking control of our lives. The Aussie way is to reject authority. We don't like those who rule over us. We don't like being constrained by laws. We don't like having our freedom taken away. But here, Jesus is a threat to these religious leaders, their independence, their freedom, their power. And it's the same for us. See, we want to be the people who make the big decisions in our lives. We want to choose where we'll go and what we'll do. We want to be the ones who work out how we spend our time and how we spend our money. We want to be people who are um, viewed as, as wonderful by those around about us. We think, well, yeah, it's possibly okay to listen to Jesus, maybe to read Jesus, probably get some ideas or advice from Jesus, but I don't want him constraining my power and my authority. Well, that's threat one. Threat two is a very different kind of threat. It's actually a threat to Peter. Now, we, we don't want to be too rough on this man. Peter uh, has come in for some pretty poor treatment, uh, it seems. He seems to be the one who puts his foot in his mouth all the time. Uh, and maybe that's not surprising. He, he's a fisherman. He seems to be a fairly brash character. Uh, he's the one who will speak up and then realize how kind of clumsy or how wrong he was. And we've seen this again and again through Mark's gospel. Now, just to pause on this, because ancient historians, uh, particularly one guy by the name of Papias in the second century, said that Peter is really the author of Mark's gospel, that Peter is the eyewitness to Jesus, and he is kind of dictating or he's passing on what he knows of Jesus through Mark to write the gospel. Now, if that's true, I think it's a great testimony to the integrity of Peter that he doesn't leave out any of the clunky stuff about him. And this passage is probably the worst. Let's have a look at it here. Because Peter uh, is, is following Jesus from a distance. Everybody else has fled, but he's, verse 54, following from a distance. And he goes as far as the courtyard of the high priest and sits with the guards there and warms himself by the fire. So he's not really up close to Jesus, who's been taken into the high priest's place, but he's not too far away either. And as he's there in the courtyard, one of the servant girls, verse 56, uh, 66, of the high priest comes to him and sees himself warming himself and looks closely at him and says, you were also with that Nazarene Jesus. She's identified him, but he denied it. I don't know or understand what you're talking about, he said, and he went out. And then the servant girl saw him there again. And she said to those standing around, this fellow is one of them. But again, he denied it. And then after a little while, those standing near said to Peter, surely you're one of them for you're a Galilean. And he began to call down curses and he swore to them, I don't know this man you're talking about. Something uh, about Peter stood out. He, he didn't quite fit in there. Uh, he was seen to be different. 
and they saw that he was from Galilee. He was a Nazarene. He was one of those with Jesus. But notice his response. This outburst here, he began to call down curses and he swore to them, I don't know this man that you're talking about. And then the rooster crows. And Peter remembers that Jesus has said before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he fell down and he wept. It's a pretty sad account, isn't it? But why is it, perhaps, do you think, that, that Peter will not own up to being a follower of Jesus? Well, it's not difficult to see, is it? What's happened to Jesus? In the middle of the night, they've come with guards, they've arrested him, they've taken him, they've brought him to the court, they've taken him to the high priest. You see, everything is going against Jesus. And it looks like Jesus' life is in serious danger. And Peter, well, if he owns up to being with Jesus, that will cost him too, won't it? It might cost him his life. It might cost him his freedom. Uh, there'll be a threat to him and his, and his future and his prospects, his comfort and, and his welfare. We, we don't know what will happen if he was to acknowledge. You see, it seems that Jesus is totally outnumbered and he's destined for disaster. And Peter's not prepared to go that way with him. <coughs> now, friends, I think that Jesus remains a threat today. Uh, he's a threat that actually leads people not to decide to follow him. I remember talking with a guy um, in Yamba one night. Uh, we were just hanging around the pub. This is a few years ago, and I was talking with some of the young people that were there talking to them about Jesus, and there's one guy who said very adamantly, look, it doesn't matter whether it's true or not, I'm not going to follow Jesus. I said, why is that? And he said, because I don't want to give up having sex with whoever I want. And I thought, yeah, okay. He doesn't want to give up his freedom. He doesn't want to give up his authority over his own life. He doesn't want to miss out on what he thinks is the good life. And to follow Jesus, I think, is going to cramp his style. You see, it's a, a great pressure on us to not own up to Jesus if it's going to get hard, if the going will be really tough, and it will be. And we're starting to see that society is moving once upon a time, and it's not that long ago, perhaps when I was a child and through my parents and my grandparents' time, if you're a Christian, then that was just pretty normal. Everybody was Christian after all. This was a Christian country after all. And we all believe similar things about life and, and, and what life is about and hard work. And, and you, you marry someone and you stay with them for life. And there's a certain sexual ethic that goes with that. None of this kind of homosexuality or transgender stuff or any of these modern things. And yet things have changed. Life is very different now. And to own up to being Christian might cost you your freedom. You might get shut down on Facebook or Instagram. You might actually lose your job. You might be cut off from your own family. You might have people opposing you. You might get cancelled. You might discover that life is really tough for following Jesus. Well, let's have a look at the third threat, because this is a different threat again, and this is a threat to Pilate. Now, the Sanhedrin, the religious leaders, didn't have authority to pass a, a death sentence on Jesus. Well, they didn't have authority to execute him anyway. Um, it, it was a little bit like the Sanhedrin might operate as a kind of a civil religious court, but it was the Romans that occupied and conducted the kind of criminal court where there could be serious punishments. And so it was important for the chief priests and the elders and the teachers of the law to hand Jesus over to the Roman authority, to Pilate. And that's what happens. And so now Jesus is bound and he's handed over to Pilate and Pilate starts asking him questions. Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus says, you've said so. And the chief priests accused Jesus of lots of things. So again, Pilate asked him, aren't you going to answer? See how many of these things they are accusing you of. But still, Jesus made no reply. And Pilate was amazed. Now, I want to pause at this point because one of the things that we've seen is we've worked through Mark's gospel and it's been thick over these last few chapters is that Jesus doesn't do anything in a vacuum. There's a deliberateness about what Jesus is doing. And it's so often it's connected with the promises that were made about him beforehand. 
And here again is one of those uh, one of those times. If you go back and you have a look at Isaiah, and Mark has told us that we need Isaiah to understand Jesus. Listen to this from Isaiah 53, and I'll, I'll read from verse 4. Surely he took up our pain, and he bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray, and each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. See, it's clearly talking here about Jesus being led like a lamb to the slaughter. He will be the sacrificial lamb. He will be the one who takes sin upon himself and pays the price for it. But let's continue. Verse 7, he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. You see, Jesus is fulfilling the promise that was made about the suffering servant back in Isaiah 53. Jesus, in his silence here, he's not protesting the accusations that are made against him. He's not defending himself. No, he is silent before his accusers. Now, he's not totally silent in this. We see him saying things. Uh, the high priest, back in the first account, says to him, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? I am, said Jesus, and you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One coming on the clouds of heaven. That's a pretty full-on response that Jesus gives, isn't it? Um, I am, I am being the name of God. He says, And you will see the Son of Man, picking up on Daniel 7 sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One, the Ancient of Days, and coming on the clouds of heaven. He is the universal ruler. Jesus is the king. He's the king over Jerusalem. He's the king over the Roman Empire. He's the king over the universe. He's the king over the Mid-North Coast. He's the king over Salt Church. Jesus is king over you. He is king over everyone. And he will rule and he will bring about his righteous judgment. And you know what? The high priest knew this is what Jesus was saying. Look at his response, verse 63. The high priest tore his clothes. Why do we need any more witnesses, he asked. You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? And they all condemned him as worthy of death. Friends, here is the Son of Man. Here is the suffering servant. Here is God's promised one, the servant king. And he's come to his people. And what do they do? They accuse Jesus of blasphemy. God turns up and they accuse him of saying that he's God. There's an irony there, isn't it? What can he do? Um, they're, they're right. He is calling himself God. But it isn't blasphemy. It's the truth. Well, back down with Pilate again. Um, Jesus makes no reply with Pilate. And uh, there is actually a custom uh, amongst the people at this time of the festival. The custom was to release a prisoner whom the people requested. And a man called Barabbas was in prison with the insurrectionists who had committed murder in the uprising. And the crowd came and asked Pilate to do for them what he usually did. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? asked Pilate, knowing it was out of self-interest that the chief priests had handed Jesus over to him. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd to have Pilate release Barabbas instead. What shall I do then with the one you're calling king of the Jews? Pilate asked them. Crucify him, they shouted. Why? What crime has he committed? asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, crucify him. Wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. He had Jesus flogged and he handed him over to be crucified. You see... Pilate is threatened by Jesus because he just wants to keep things calm and comfortable. Pilate doesn't want the crowd to be opposed to him. He doesn't want another uprising. He wants to be popular, the popular procurator, if you like. He wants people to be just happy and content, and he wants to be able to go with the flow. And I think, isn't that the same threat that we feel sometimes when we go to follow Jesus? When we 
uh, are living in a culture that is so foreign to Jesus to poke your head up above and, and own up to being Christian is a tough thing to do at times. It, it might be costly. And of course, there are all sorts of things that we just don't want to go there because if we start talking about things like sin and judgment and hell, if we start talking about how, how God has made us and has a right to our lives and will one day call us to account, that's not particularly popular stuff, is it? To talk about that, let alone talking about our views on, on male and female and sexual ethics, and let alone talking about our understanding of how you can be right with God and how how Christianity, we believe, is the way to be right with God, that Jesus is God and the only way to God. And if you start talking about that stuff, you're going to get seriously in trouble. And we just want to keep the peace. We just want to go with the flow. We just, just want to kind of cruise through life. Let's not make things too difficult. Jesus can be a threat. You see, there are threats in following Jesus. They're very real. That's the truth. And we see this right through Mark's gospel. If, if you come back with me to Mark chapter 4, Jesus warned that there would be different responses to him. And he told a parable, a parable about a farmer who sowed seed. And then he unpacks the meaning of this parable to his disciples. And he said to them, let me tell you about this parable. Some people are like seed sown along the path where the word is sown. And as soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. And others are like seed sown on rocky places. They hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. And when trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. That's what we see going on, isn't it? Still others, like seeds sown among the thorns, hear the word. But the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth and the desire for other things come in and they choke the word, making it unfruitful. You see, we don't want to be out of step with our culture. We don't want to be in conflict with the world around about us. And so when things get too tough, Jesus says there'll be some who just wither away no longer following him. Well, Jesus warned that we would need to count the cost if we were going to follow him. And so after saying that he was indeed the Messiah, he said, whoever wants to be my disciple, this is chapter 8, verse 34, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. There's a guy, isn't there, he, uh, a rich fellow who comes to Jesus and he says in chapter 10, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And they go on this discussion about keeping the law and he thinks that he has. He thinks that he's always done this. And so Jesus looked at him and he loved him. Verse 21. One thing you lack, he said, go and sell everything you have and give to the poor and then you will have in treasure in heaven and then come follow me. And at this the man's face fell and he went away sad because he had great wealth. You see, it can be difficult to follow Jesus. It means trusting him rather than trusting in our wealth, trusting in our education, trusting in our relationships, trusting in things in this life. It means trusting Jesus even if we lose our life for him. But the disciples who say, well, we have given up things for you. Say that to Jesus, and he replies, verse 29, I tell you, truly, no one who's left home or brothers or sister or mother or father or, or children or fields for me and for the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, fields, along with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. Friends, we need to count the cost of following Jesus. There'll be times when there is a very real cost, when that threat impacts us significantly. And yet to remember that there is a huge reward, that to follow Jesus is to follow the one who can be trusted. And we can testify to the fact that when you give up things for Jesus, he gives back many times more. I'm not talking about you send in $1,000 to this this uh, telly preacher and they'll uh, you'll reap a reward of getting a, a grand house or some of that kind of nonsense 
I'm just saying that you get back far more, far more that's real and lasting and substantial. Yes, there'll be persecutions. There'll be trouble. There'll be strife. There'll be threats. But we get back far more in return and with that eternal life. And so, friends, I want to ask you, are you willing to trust Jesus? If you've never done that, will you do that? And if you are a Christian and you are trusting in Jesus, when the threats come, hang in there. Keep looking to Jesus. Know that he is trustworthy. Don't be sucked aside. Don't give in to the threat. But trust him with your life. That's the only way.